This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Allison Cook, Lindsay Trebet, and Super Inframan. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I am with Ren Collier. Hey everyone. And Greg Bishop. Hello! All the way from the far, far shores of California. Yeah, it's uh, sun's just going down here and it's, it's nice and cool. <laughs> At least we're here. It's only 70 now. Oh, it's only 70. <laughs> I, th- I think it hit 60 today at the hottest here. Yeah, I was out in the desert. It was 95 earlier. Oh, man. Yeah. As we were talking beforehand, I don't like it over 70. I don't like it under 70. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we could be roommates. <laughs> no. No, no, not unless we had, you know, stayed in your part of the house and there was a, there was a, a ceiling, uh, a door with weather stripping around it between us. Because <laughs> in the summer, my, my house is usually around 65 and it's perfect. And you'd oh, be miserable. Oh, that's fine for me. Oh, no, no, okay. inside, I like it, you know, 65, 70, especially in the summer. Ah, okay. All right. Because when I go out, it's like, you know, 90, 100, 110, you know, so it's like, yeah, I'd, like, I'd rather be in cool air inside. <laughs> All right, uh, so we are scrapping the initial plans for tonight's show. We're going to reschedule that, and instead, we're just kind of going to kind of go do a uh, kind of walking the road. What was I calling them? I did two episodes, and I named them something, and I liked what I named them, and I no longer remember what I named them. Go okay. back and look when you when you post, and you just name it properly. Uh, well, sure, but I'm I'm going to look up the name right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> wandering the road? Yeah, I think it was wandering the road. Thank you, Ren. Oh. So there's no specific topic tonight, so we'll just uh, talk and see where it goes. And uh, yeah, wandering the road. I've done two of these before, and they seem to work out pretty well. So, uh, But the first well, thing that well, people keep... When you know who you're talking to, it's, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what people keep, of course, asking me about is this whole Pentagon release that I barely even noticed. Um, where basically the Pentagon has acknowledged that the stuff that the TTSA put out, those two or three videos, were legitimate videos. Yeah, well, that, it came out it came out before them too, but whatever. Yeah, but I mean, the the Department of Defense basically just acknowledged that, yep, those are real. <laughs> and that's that to me. That seems like about all that happened there. As in, are they they are real files of a video that is composed of data? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that that they're not like hoaxes or anything like that. They're they're actual, you know, they they are what they say they are, where they're from, but they don't know what the objects are. Doesn't least. necessarily mean it's still not a hoax. Just that it is a real video. <laughs> True. Well, they they say they don't know what the objects on the video is. Yeah. Are. Yeah. Well, they- which may or may not be the case. Yeah, I, I really don't know what they think, but whatever, to me, and, you know, I've got a, I've got a special weird um, idea about, uh, can you hear that horrible noise? Yeah, what is that? It's somebody with a Porsche 911 that starts it up and then just revs it in the driveway for 10 minutes before he goes anywhere. Oh, no, there he goes. There he goes. <laughs> the Harley wow. guy is the guy that's, that revs for 10 minutes. Because I don't know if his mother never told him he was a good boy or what. We have to listen to his stupid motorcycle all day. <laughs> anyway, um, whenever the, these things are in where was I going? I don't know. The, the, you, see, you had some sort of a s- special idea about this? Oh, well, I don't know if it's special. But um, because of the way my, my conspiracy brain works, mm-hmm. especially because of the Project Beta stuff, when I hear... Um, something be announced by anyone i don't care if it's the government or a private company or even just somebody you know um i'm always wondering what the what the purpose is behind it and if the government does anything especially the military um 
uh, with a sort of a hot button topic like this, I guess. I mean, I guess most people are just like, yo, okay, they're real. Um, the, there's a specific reason that they do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, and I think there's, you know, the, the, I don't know if it's hoax or not. I kind of think that it's not. Um, and even if it is, um, it's, what's the effect? The effect is uh, more people feel okay to talk about it. Um, uh, anybody who is watching from another country, like an adversary, um, it may direct them in some certain direction. Uh, what else? Um, how do how does this make the rest of the military and the companies and the military industrial complex machine feel? How does it affect them? Um, there, there, there's, there's, you know, all those questions come up in my mind, yeah, and including some more when when something like this happens. I'm, I'm always wondering about motivations, and I'm always wondering about what is. Um, how does it affect? Oh, here's what I wrote. My, my questions are, why now? Why the DOD? How does it affect the policies and thinking of the military and the private companies that supply it? And what dichotomy and or narrative is created or created or encouraged? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's almost like a like a magic show, right? This release is the trick. It, it's what you're it's the misdirection, like what you're supposed to be watching. But what's really important is what the magician is doing with his other hand. Mm hmm. But what are yeah. they doing? That yeah, that's the question. Um, I mean, do you have any theories on that, Greg? Because I I thought exactly the same things you thought. Like, a this is a this is the same video and story that has been coming out multiple times yeah. over the last like three years. It's nothing new. Uh, but the the one really interesting thing that I've noticed, and I think Tim Banal also noticed this on Twitter, is that the public response to it seems to be exactly the same every single time it happens. Like, he, he was making a joke that it was, like, in 28... Like, all these people, uh, you know, stuff came out in 2018. They're like, wow, 2018 was so crazy that the U.S. government admitted aliens were real and no one cared. And then they're like, you know, wow, 2019 was so crazy that the U.S. Uh, government declared that aliens were real and then no one paid attention to it. And it's the same thing this time. All of a sudden, people are acting like this is something new. And that's... UFO people are. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I just think, uh, regular people on Twitter I know that don't have any real interest in this. I've seen them. Oh, I see. About it. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like there's obviously like some kind of public propaganda reason this is being released periodically every year like this. And that that's what I'm really curious if you have any theories about like <clears> why, the, why the perception management. Well, I think it's, you know, it, as you point out every year, it's a goose for something. They're goosing <laughs> the, 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 uh, the subject or the people or involved with it or whatever for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe even the phenomenon. I don't know. But um, I think the uh, the thing that it just, you know, intuitively, when I saw this, the first thing I thought is um, I think they're trying to encourage research into weirdness, into non-material science. Not non, um, yeah, non-materialistic science, as, it call, as it's called. I think that's part of it. I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. I sound like a total conspiracy wacko, but um, that's a very, it, to me, it seems like a really important undercurrent of a lot of what's going on. A lot of what's going on right now, like you know, in the in the '70s, you had the remote viewing program, and you mm -hmm. had what's his, you know, you had uh, people looking at Yuri Geller, and you had who's that guy, Cleve Baxter, who was doing the plant research, you know, about what, what if plants can feel pain and all that. John yep. Lilly was trying to talk to dolphins on a on a, um, <laughs> a grant from the Navy, I believe, partially. <laughs> anyway, and that supposedly didn't come to too much. However, um, there's more people that are open to it. The instrumentation is different now. Um and methodologies have changed, and the acceptance is is greater. So, I think that part of this may be trying to goose that segment of the the, the uh, research community into taking taking weirdness seriously. Hmm. But that that's what's strange hmm. to me because I, I I don't disagree with you at all on this. Um, it's just an I, idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm guessing like why do they need the justification? Because, like you said, in the 1970s. 
we were studying remote viewing, psychic phenomena, and I, I don't think that research ever really ceased, right? Maybe it, I think it ceased uh, in in the public sector, but it definitely continued in the private sector. You know, like all of the, the Army RV guys went on to form their own private companies yeah. and are still doing contract work for government agencies to this day. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it, so why all of a sudden... The, the government, I guess what I'm saying, they've never had a problem researching this stuff clandestinely. So why the drive to public research? Uh, because they want private companies to not be scared of doing this kind of thing, maybe. And then they can mm. approach them if they get good at it. I don't know. This stuff is cyclical as well, depending on who's in power, what the administration is, yeah. what uh, who's running the Pentagon, whatever. I think it's 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 uh, that definitely affects what's going on. Because the remote viewing pro- program was shut down. I mean, skeptic would say because it never did anything, which uh, I would yeah. disagree with. But mm-hmm. um, but it was shut down. I think, as far as I can tell, because it just became people that the people that had the power to say yes or no um, became ascendant, and they could say no, and that that meant no. Whereas before, they had somebody like you know Stubblebine uh, pushing for them, and they and they uh, and they'd, they'd go ahead with it. Yeah, the end of that program was political more than anything. I mean, it got right. results, and there was there's plenty of documentation for that. And I also don't think, I mean, the Army's program was ended for sure, but I don't think that, uh, given the effectiveness of it and what it, you know, the usefulness that it had, mm-hmm. I, I can't imagine the government completely abandoned it. I just I just think that the research might have went more, uh, more dark or started centering within agencies like the CIA that were less public about or less, you know, publicly accountable than, than like the army or Navy Yeah, or pushed it in the private sector. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's what I, I was saying too about like the whole Bigelow aerospace thing. It's like the, the U S government never stopped to being interested in psychic phenomena and UFOs. Uh, they just started contracting all that research out to the private sector uh, because they don't the you know, private sector is not foyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that mm-hmm. and it's um, as long as you have an interested party or parties and you throw some money at it, it'll mm-hmm. keep going. You don't have to have some administration person come in and say, nope. So, yeah. you know, if you're if you have the wherewithal to get these programs going and to push them forward, it won't be, you know, you, you don't have the you don't have the oversight, like you said, of programs. And plus, on top of that, you um, uh, if you've got an interested individual that really is behind it, like big, like a Bigelow, mm-hmm. then you keep it going for probably quite a bit longer. And as you said, yeah, you don't really have to reveal anything because it's it's a private company, so all that stuff is just unfoilable, as you say. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, do you, and, and do you think the government really knows much more about the UFO phenomena than we do? Sometimes I think yes, and sometimes I think no. But <laughs> <clears throat> the way I think they know more about it is they have a lot more data right. than, than we do. Ideas about it, it's probably all over the map. Although, here's another thing in the news, that thing about the French um, uh, uh, government officials saying that UFOs are interdimensional. It's like, wow, I guess he's been listening to Valet for the past, you know, 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that. Which is kind of amazing because somebody in the government would actually say, well, you know what, I don't know if he said it in official capacity or what, but the point being that that idea has been around since the 19th, well, if you talk about occult circles, way longer than that, but as as far as UFOs, it's been around since the 1940s, late 40s, when uh, when, uh, uh, Mark Probert and... and, uh, uh, and that group in San Diego started publishing the, um, their stuff from Borderland Science, yeah. and, so, and you know, saying that the the, sh- the beings were etheric and um, yeah. and they were not that. they were not physical, and that uh, you know, yeah. So the, the idea has been around a really, really, really long time. People don't really think about that, you know, uh, how early things are, mm-hmm. how early people thought of things like, oh, nobody knew about this interdimensional thing. It's like. No, contactees basically channeling contactees were saying, like, of course they would, but they were saying this in the in the late forties. Yeah, it's well, interesting. I think, I think too. I think within certain circles within the government, I think that they've always kind of known that, or I've known that there is like a dis- a link between, say, psychic phenomena and and UFOs. I, I don't think they were there was ever a group within the the U.S. intelligence community or the u.s government that seriously 
consider these things to be extraterrestrial in nature. Um, really? I think that was the main so. idea all along. It's just there were schisms into the areas we're talking about. Go ahead. No, I, I mean, you could be totally right. I think that once they started actually doing real research on it, I think that that's probably that that I think they probably abandoned the extraterrestrial hypothesis a long time ago, uh, if mm-hmm. if it existed at all within within those communities. And it, like you said, there may have been multiple groups, like some groups that that. Oh, there's always multiple thing. groups. Yeah. When you say the government, I never think of it as <laughs> like this giant yeah. entity that that all thinks the same way. It's basically like a hodgepodge of all these different opinions and ideas and everything under this umbrella of something that's supposed to be the government. Um, right. But I, I, I think, I think it, I would disagree with you and say that most people that looked into this mm-hmm. in an official capacity were looking at it from the ETH angle mm-hmm. way up until maybe, um, you know, may, maybe just recently, but certainly in the mm-hmm. 50s, 60s, 70s, I think that was the, just like in ufology, I think that was the main idea because it flatters all our prejudices about it. Um, and I don't think that the people, whereas they might be a lot more efficient and maybe a lot smarter and have a lot more access to data, some of the people that were interested in it on the inside, they mm-hmm. didn't have this like over overarching idea against the ETH. I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. I, it's just it's it's just I think it's human nature in in our in this last century, especially, and sort of into this century, to think that it, like uh, like Mac Tonis used to say, it's a, it's a it's it's it flatters all our prejudices, and it's he said <laughs> what did he used to call it? He said that idea is delicious. It's something oh, yeah, that, yeah. that people are like, oh yes, they're they're aliens coming from other planets because mm-hmm. that's what makes the most sense to most people. So I, I think that maybe the uh, most of people that were in that were in any kind of co- official capacity. We're probably hamstrung by that idea for maybe up to real, really recently. And then there's a few people that were, you know, reading Keel and Valet and a few other people back back in the 70s, 80s, whatever, that didn't agree with that. Um, mm-hmm. And I've, I, I talked to a few of them, um, but it didn't give, they did not give me the impression that it was widespread. In mm-hmm. fact, I think maybe a few of them said, yeah, I can't get my colleagues to, you know, even look at this. Mm-hmm. So... Well, I would think military-minded people are going to think very nuts and bolts about this stuff. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm specifically thinking in, in terms of intelligence stuff. Like, maybe this is just because I've been reading Sinister Forces, but I I think yeah, about the CIA in wrong. particular, and I, I wonder if... Because, okay, so some, some landmark abduction cases or encounter cases, I believe, are... <laughs> were probably military operations or intelligence operations like uh, Antonio Villaboas and also um, like the Hill abduction. Like I'm at the point where I, I don't like the Hill abduction stinks to high heaven for me. And every time I look at it with fresh eyes, I'm like, this looks more and more like some sort of operation. Hmm. And I never really thought that way, but that's interesting. Yeah. There's, it's not <coughs> so much the actual events of the, of the abduction, but all aftermath. of the, the aftermath, all of the people that get involved, like the fact that like Barney's friend was this guy who worked for intelligence and every single person who is like an MK ultra adjacent spook is like involved in that case. And it's, it's super, it stinks to high heaven. And I and um, just came to it afterwards, but go ahead. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing is that, and that's what I was kind of going to in a roundabout way. Perhaps there was an interest because people in intelligence, because we know like from CIA records and stuff that they were interested in like occultism and like specifically for the purposes of like mind control, Mm -hmm. right? Like looking into how people can be influenced maybe psychically or through drugs. And I think that they were looking at some of these UFO cases, these contact cases, and they're like, okay, well, these people are encountering something that essentially reprograms them, right? This is exactly Mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. This is our agency's like mission right now is to try to figure out how to reprogram people in the same way. Oh, so I, I see. I think that they may have, at least within those groups, had may have been looking at the UFO phenomena not as an extraterrestrial thing, but as some sort of phenomena that was reprogramming people and exploring how they could replicate those effects in the population. Oh, that makes that makes uh, a lot of sense. I did write something in the uh, 
uh, at UFO Mystic about um, UFOs as a cosmic art project, which is mm -hmm. kind of on these same lines, is that if you could create a piece of artwork that would change people's lives in, in a minute or two, like a UFO mm -hmm. uh, encounter, or even any real paranormal encounter, but um, particularly UFO encounters, um, then you would probably be the best artist that ever lived. Mm -hmm. Change somebody's entire outlook, um, you know, have them start religions, ruin their lives, whatever it is, just from, you know, two minutes of seeing something that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, yep. That that would be a powerful tool, yes. I never thought of it that way. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the holy grail of the, you know, MK Ultra CIA of the 1970s, yeah. you know. That, that's what they were trying to find. Yeah, but I think they found some of those things, but they couldn't control how it manifested. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I think with this UFO thing, too, I mean, you never know how somebody's going to react. I guess if you could just drive them nuts... That would help too. That's what I keep telling friends of mine, especially ones that are getting more and more like interested in one idea and say, this is it. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, the UFO thing, if you've got a loose thread, and I've been saying this for a while, if there's a loose thread in your makeup, mm -hmm. um, UF, the UFO thing will pull that thread really hard and unravel you. If you <laughs> what What about the Villas Boas case that you think is uh Yeah, you know, how about that? Well, when he talks about the craft, it sounds like a helicopter. I mean, the description that he gives sounds an awful lot like a helicopter. It does. And, I don't remember oh, yeah. the description. Who had never seen a helicopter would say a helicopter was. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, it was like a yeah, round, this. like a round kind of egg-shaped thing, and it had like a whirling blade like above it and stuff. It it sounds a lot like how someone would describe a helicopter, like like Greg said, if they'd never seen one before. Uh huh. But I think, like in the in the Villa Boas case, and I think also in the uh, the Hill abduction, um, both of them involve some kind of substance being administered to the person, and them having this whole recollection of this fantastic event. But I think this fantastic event is a post hypnotic thing mm. that has been added, because like the, the thing that always the, the seed of this, it, at least with the Hill abduction, got placed in my head when I was reading the Interrupted Journey again a couple of years ago, and. Uh, Betty like overhears some of the abductors like talking to each other. They're, they're like getting impatient with her, and they're like talking to each other. Like these don't sound like aliens. These just sound like guys, <laughs> you know, just like normal guys. A couple like, of pissed off normal guys. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And like, and she gets, um, you know, she feels like, like she's given a shot, an injection of something on the way to the, you know, quote unquote craft. So I, I think what was probably what probably happened is that they were intercepted along the road they were being surveilled you know because remember they mentioned that the beans that they see or they remember seeing on the road that stopped them they thought they had seen them in a diner before and I, I think that they were probably being followed and surveilled and you know they were intercepted along the road in a place where you know maybe no other cars would come by they could be secluded i think they were drugged and then there were there was like a post-hypnotic suggestion placed inside of them about this experience that they had. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I could be completely wrong, but when I look at all of the people that are involved with the case, like their treatment, like Dr. Dr. Simon, uh, even Kehoe to some extent, all of these people have some, either some kind of relationship with, with the proto MK ultra stuff. Cause it wasn't quite MK ultra years yet. It was, a, it was a little bit before that. But yeah. they all are people who are involved in military intelligence, um, mind control kind of stuff. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, I think Simon was part of like Eisenhower's like military psychology department or something. I have to go and look at it. But everybody involved is either a spook or involved in like mind control experiments. So when I look at that cast of characters and how closely they latch onto the, the hills afterwards and follow them around and observe what they do and everything, it, it says to me, like, either they're observing the results of an experiment they did, or they're trying to replicate what was done to the hills, if the hills had a genuinely, you know, otherworldly experience. Yeah. Okay. I never thought about it that way. That's that's insightful and frightening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm normally like I, I don't get into the whole MyLabs thing a whole lot, but once I started reading into the history of like MK Ultra and stuff, it it kind of 
made me start looking more closely at some of these older cases and, and wondering, like, how much of this was, you know, le- legitimate? How much of this is early experiments in, like, LSD and, and post-hypnotic mm-hmm. suggestion? Because, um, mm-hmm. you know, some stuff, like, you know... But the lines get blurred, right? Because even Streber's uh, experiences yeah. have, you know... There is this whole narrative when he was younger of him being experimented on by the military. Yeah. So it's like, where does the where do those lines? There's, you know, where there's, those lines there's also blurry. there's also the incident he had where the I think the thing was put in his ear where he heard people outside yeah. his house. Yeah, and he, he did he say you like woke up and there was like a woman and a man like standing in the room with him and like it wasn't yeah. the visitors it was people. Yeah, but no, but none of his alarms went off or anything. Yeah, which yeah, and then he found out that the alarm had been like broken or disabled, short circuit or disabled. Yeah, yeah. Disabled. in a way disabled. that you, yeah, he talked about that on my show actually. When I but he he talked about it before, but mm, I had yeah. forgotten really until he brought it up again. Disabled in a way it shouldn't have been able to be disabled, if I remember right. Yes, that's what I remember too. So I'm um, remembering wrong too for both. Of them. That you know <laughs> to, to bring it back to the the pentagon stuff we were talking about earlier that's what i was like kind of making fun of people on twitter about i was like and just the whole idea of disclosure in the first place i think is on its surface ridiculous because you're you're talking about a country that has spent the last you know 70 plus years experimenting with mind control perception management you know disinformation you look at the history of MK Ultra, the you know Tuskegee syphilis experiments, all the like the bioweapons testing on its own population, Lyme disease. You, you look at all this stuff and you think, yeah, no, I, but I trust them when it comes to UFOs, <laughs> and it just seems absurd to me. It's like, why would you believe anything that comes out of these people's mouths, no matter yeah. if it's something that you want to believe? Like, they're not the people who are who you should trust. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that, I've I've people ask me about the disclosure thing, and I've been mm-hmm. I, I keep repeating this. Just the disclosure, as UFO people uh, uh, understand it, is asking somebody who's never told you the truth to tell you the truth <laughs> this one time. And if you don't believe, if they you don't hear what they say, then they're then they're covering it up. If if they yeah. they say what you want to hear, they're telling the truth. And if they don't, it's a cover up. So you know, it's just a, this self defeating. It's like no, I mean, the disclosure is a horrible word. I hate mm-hmm. that. Yeah. It's got mm-hmm. all these these like ridiculous things attached to it, mm-hmm. and it forces. Yeah, it's that same thing I said about you know what 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 it, what are you trying to make people think? What are you, what what if you control what people argue about, you can mm-hmm. keep them away from the stuff you don't want them seeing or arguing about. So yeah. you said that's why I say false dichotomy a lot, where people say it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. It's like. It could be like a hundred other things. You're arguing two sides of one tiny little thing. Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of what I think about disclosure, too. It's just kind of like, eh, it, should, it should be done away with, that whole movement. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, and I even thought that like when they were coming out with the Roswell stuff and saying, this is what it was. I'm going, at this point, they can just tell us the truth and no one's going to believe them anyway. Yeah, exactly. Well, most of the UFO community didn't believe any of the, you know, the, I remember this was, wasn't then like in the late 90s that they had yeah. like the Roswell disclosure stuff? And, you know, I don't remember anybody 97, believing it. 97, yes, because yeah. they had it for the 50th anniversary of Roswell, which I went to. I remember there was a big uproar over that, uh, mm-hmm. the final, what's it called? Um, case closed. Yeah, case closed. <laughs> that, that giant big fat report that came out from the air yeah. force which i wish i had a copy of those things are worth a lot now really <laughs> i think i've got a redacted crappy version of it or something but that big like horse choker one with all the pictures of the dummies in it and everything yeah it's kind of rare and valuable right now i mean it doesn't not fit for what might have happened but but again at this point they've lied so many times that yeah. no one's going to believe anything they say unless they say, okay, it was it was a, a flying saucer. And then suddenly they'll be like, see, we told you. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I was telling my friends. Like, in, in Mirage Men, they, they, what was it? Was it at Edwards Air Force Base that the, the flying saucer, there was supposedly footage of this flying saucer, like, landing and, like, Dwight Eisenhower, like, meeting aliens or something? Yeah, it was either. The, yeah, that, that, was, that was one of them. The other one was the um, uh, Holloman film. 
Yeah. And I'm like, if they have that video, why don't they release that? Like, I'll believe that. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah, well, I would have believed it if they released it in the 70s or something. Now, I yeah. Yeah. now probably not. But I'm like, if they have that video, why not sh- send us that one? You know, why not, why not declassify that one? Because that sounds way more interesting than the stupid Tic Tac video. <laughs> I mean, I'm also assuming that that video was real in the first place. The, um, you know, the flying saucer landing. I, I pr- think that's probably not a thing that actually ever existed, but... I don't so, want to so, seem like I'm being like throwing the whole thing out, but the UFO subject, I think it, there is no way you can't have ambiguity in it. That's just how it works. Yeah. And you have to, you have to navigate this ambiguity to something that you're comfortable with um, until, you know, cause it's going to be, everybody's going to have their own truth about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try not to have a truth about it, which is why, you know, when Ren says that, so it's like, wow, I never really thought about it that way, but that's pretty cool. And that now that goes in my little box of babies. Mm-hmm. Right. And right. that's all I have for the UFO thing. The only thing I have in the box that's not a maybe is something's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, some, what you, some, something's going on, and it's been going on throughout written history. Yeah. People have had experiences, so there's something there, but what it is... Yeah, and it's. I think it's very individualized. In fact, that yes. at the end of one of the chapters in the, what, the book we were going to talk about, I was reading it. Actually, I was listening to it, and the last thing he said, I was actually sitting in the car listening to it, and I cheered audibly <laughs> when I heard this line from um, Eighth Tower. And what I got to find it. And talk amongst yourselves. We're, yeah, part three is kind of long here. Here we go. The very last part of part two, um, uh, our monsters and pseudo, pseudo spacemen have never revealed an intelligence beyond, beyond low animal intelligence. If the pattern of the phenomenon indicate intelligent order and purpose, we have not been viewing the masters, only the slaves. To understand this intelligence, this thing that hides from us by donning a million silly disguises, we must examine the percipients and try to understand what they really experience, not what they think they experience. And that goes for UFO investigators, too. Yeah. They have to understand what their motivations are and what they're looking for, because if they don't, they're going to just blindly go where their opinions go and not where the data goes or whatever. And not even where the data goes. I mean, it's just the whole thing is is so malleable and it's such a Rorschach blot. Um, and, and then you throw hypnosis into it and it just gets the 10 times worse. <clears throat> yeah, I mean... I guess some the signal to noise in a lot of this is really, really, really high, especially with something like hypnosis. And you have to realize that. And people, for the longest time, have been taking all this information as gospel as long as it agrees with their prejudices. And that's a problem because it'll it'll provide you ample reason to agree with your prejudices. Oh, sorry, it'll provide you ample reason to agree with your prejudices if you if you let it, because right. that's the way it's made. I was. Um, uh, I, I was looking at uh, the, the people involved in, like, I don't know, it was a while back in one of these, some new group. I can't even remember what the name of it was. But one of them was like, you know, it's like, where the hell did this guy come from? He used to, like, you know, run, what did he do? I can't remember. Like, he ran a business, like, um, uh, had something to do with, like, strip clubs or something. <laughs> And I was thinking, what is this guy doing on the board of this thing? And I was, and then after a while, I was like, oh, wait a second. That's exactly what should be happening. There has to be some, some weirdness in there like that, or it just wouldn't come together. Yeah. Anybody that tries to be completely above board and ve- seem, seemingly very scientific and respectable, the, the phenomenon doesn't like that. <laughs> uh, Greg, that's why, you know, the, the, the book that we were going to talk about tonight um, – and Magonia, when I was reading those in 2016, when I started kind of getting back into this stuff, I was reading, you know, this book in Magonia, and I realized, like, studying ufology is not going to give me any answers here. Like, and that's kind of when I started studying, like, magic and, like, studying, like, you know, old grimoires and old Neoplatonic texts and Hermetica and stuff, because I realized that, like, that's where I'm going to find my answers to this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like it's, it's very individualist. It's not going to be in science. It's going to be in the yes. weird. Yeah, science has part of it. Mm-hmm. You you have part of it. Um, um, artists have part of it. Mm-hmm. Everybody has a part of it. But then it you know if you get into the community, everybody thinks that their part of it is what it is. 
Mm-hmm. And they don't, they don't, you know, anybody that's not on with the science thing, it's like, oh, you're just in, in, engaged in a lot of mumbo jumbo. And the, yeah. and the, you know, the mumbo jumbo people, the non-materialists or whatever, it's like, oh, you just worship science like it's going to answer everything. <laughs> and I agree with both of those groups. I re- mm-hmm. agree with both of those attitudes. Well, like mm-hmm. like I was telling you earlier, Ren, like my, my thing was I was always interested in UFOs and then mm-hmm. I got into like the occult stuff and it was mm-hmm. at some point that well, I think it was somewhere in Transformation where Strieber's talking about an experience and I'm going, now wait a minute, that's like very similar to what happened to me, except mine didn't have any UFO connotations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, was- and I started going, how much of this stuff is the same thing? It's just we're approaching it from different directions. Yeah, and, and Keel even talks about that. Like, for me, it was reading um, uh, the thing in Magonia where Valet is talking about fascist card and, and him, like, conjuring the sylphs, you know, and these sylphs are basically acting just like Adamski, you know, mm-hmm. space brothers. And I'm like, huh, I was like, these may actually be the same thing, you know, and it may be different window dressing, depending yes. on who's observing it, but, like, yeah. it's the same phenomena, and, like, I, I would rather figure out how to conjure the aliens than wait for a government <laughs> agency to tell me what they are, you know? This, well, is, why, this is why Israel Rigardi t- uh, told everybody that wanted to get into the Golden Dawn, it's like, go see a psychologist for a very heavy yeah. session of uh, 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 a series of um, things to find out what might be wrong with you before you do anything about this. You have to know yourself before you start delving into this stuff because if you don't know yourself it'll take you over yeah yeah well and, and i mean p- part of that too is is learning about who you are d- w- when you're you know doing occult practices and stuff yeah I mean, thing. That, that is delving into yourself so the golden daughter is going to do that but yeah this i think the psychotherapy thing was to make sure that it doesn't go overly negative when you start seeing these things about yourself or yeah, or negative, or yeah. yeah. The f- only thing I say, I, I said this to Ren before. It's like it seems like ninety-five percent of the people get in the Golden Dawn. Their first question is, "When do I get to smite?" Which means yeah. they shouldn't be in the Golden Dawn. Yeah, they shouldn't be in any kind of occult practice if that's your attitude. And and I think Crowley had once said, you know, it doesn't matter why people get into it because by the time they are capable of actually doing damage like that, they would know better than to do it. Yeah. Well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think the real danger is obsession, and I think that's what Rigardi was warning against. And this is yeah. a thing that affects researchers who are, you know, not involved in the occult at all. It's a thing that can affect anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you have to have something else other than what you're studying here, because if you let it, it will take over your entire life, and that never ends well for anyone. Yeah, yeah. You, gotta get, you have to step away from it every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, you better have something you can step away from to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it, it will take up your entire life, and if it does, um, after a while, nobody's going to want to listen to you anymore, with good reason. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you also get trapped in your own sort of uh, paradigm after a while too, unless you know how to break those down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or I just say, okay, that's uh, I'm, I'm going a little crazy. I think I'm going to, you know, like you said, step away. Mm-hmm. If something starts to bother you too much, because I was desperately paranoid for about a year, and I just got tired of it. I got tired of being afraid every minute of the day. It just it's it wears on you. So, you know, I it's just a certain point. I just said, well, screw this, and I made a conscious effort to stop being paranoid. And the funny thing was, within a month or two of me not stopping the paranoia, stuff stopped happening to me. Like the mail wasn't opened anymore. <laughs> so was that was that uh, you know it, was that a coincidence or is that because I made a conscious decision not to be paranoid anymore? Because the mail was opened. I mean, it, the, only two people I got re- letters from. Everything else was fine. All my letters from Carla Turner and Peter Jordan, the cattle mutilation researcher, were all torn open, destroyed, or lost. Every mm. single one. And what 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 do you think the the force behind that was? I have no idea. Okay. And the thing is, if you want somebody, if you don't want somebody to know your mail's getting open, they don't have to know. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's very easy to open up the, you know, steam open the letter or whatever the hell it is. So somebody obviously wanted me to know that the, the mail was getting looked at. But then when I decided to stop being paranoid, the mail stopped being opened. <laughs> <laughs> right. What is, what like is it was that trial? Yeah, you know, it's almost like it was a test to see if you could overcome that paranoia, you know. And once you overcame it. There was no need to, to mess with you anymore like that. 
Yeah, if you assign it to somebody that really, a government agency opening up the mail and trying to freak me out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. It might have been, you know... (laughs) It might have it might have been a ported problems. I have no you know, like a poltergeist in the mail. I have no idea. Although some of the mail actually had stickers on it saying, So sorry, the post office apologizes, it got eaten up in the machine. <laughs> so may- maybe it falls more into the line of synchronicity. Possibly. I don't know. I mean I I'm ready to believe any of those things, which I think keeps me sane. <laughs> <laughs> I re- yeah. I remember in um it defies language you Huh? Or none of them. <laughs> uh, I remember in, in Defiance Language, you were talking about like someone walking the same pace as you were above you in the apartment yes. above you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it went on for like five or ten minutes, and it scared the crap out of me. I mean, they would go to every room, and this was like three in the morning, too. Yeah, that's like, I don't know. I feel like if that's the government, how are they doing that? Why are they bothering to do that? That seems like a lot of time and effort. There was a lot of stuff going on then. I mean, I I had a phone call with this uh, Navy guy, and it scared the crap out of me. I recorded the whole thing, and then I hid them in. I hid the tapes in um, uh, 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 oatmeal cans with oatmeal on top (laughs) of. That's how paranoid I was. Um, I had noises. Why did that scare you? Because I didn't want somebody to steal the tapes and hear what we talked about. Even though you could have tapped my line very easily, Um, it was just. You know, and the guy was there. But the guy made me paranoid, and I, maybe he was there to do that. I have no idea. But you know, he's he's dead now, apparently. In fact, I I I, I, have, I have communicated with his wife, and I he he is he he died in 1999. Hmm. At not too old of an age, I think he was like thir- in his mid 30s. So, so what type of stuff were you talking about that you that made you paranoid? I can't remember exactly, but it had to do with mind control stuff it had to do with the ufo subject it had to do with you know uh why certain researchers are interesting to people in intelligence and what they do about that and who they pay attention to and i mean the guy really did a number on me it's like we well, are writing about ufos you've you've got a file on yourself and i was simultaneously frightened and flattered by that which is exactly <laughs> what i think they wanted me to think huh did you ever have any um, like Man in Black encounters during that time period? No, which is so weird because um, I actually I interviewed Dean Radin in ninety seven, whenever his book came out, whenever the first book Conscious Universe came out, mm-hmm. and he asked me the same thing. He says, "Have you had any Man in Black type things?" And I said, "No," and he goes, "Well, you probably will." <laughs> but as far as I know, that never happened. I never had anybody come and ask me weird questions or tell me what to think or anything like that or make tell me to shut up. Huh. I had I had a few weird phone calls by people who were who I don't know how they got my phone number. I did have phone calls where the phone would ring like uh and this was in the nineties. There's you know, no I did have a cell phone, it was just a little stupid flip phone, but um my home phone would ring and if I picked it up there was either nothing there or or a weird noise on the line, which I always thought was like a tone designed to like mind control me, so I'd hang up right away. But if I didn't answer the phone it would ring like forty, fifty times. <laughs> wow. It was it was insane, and this would happen all day. Like, and then it would stop for a week, and then for three or four days, phone calls constantly all day with nobody on the other end. If I picked them up, so so what what do you think of the Camellio stuff that Robert Guffey wrote about? Haven't read it yet. Don't hit oh, me. Really? Yeah, oh. I, have the, I actually have the book. You should definitely still- read it. I think it's really fascinating. Um, and there's a guy up here who was like a DJ for a radio station in Buffalo. Uh, who had contacted me, and he can't come on because of his contract, I guess, with the radio station in Buffalo. Um, but he was talking, uh, he said a lot of, s- some some of the stuff was happening to him where he was seeing people in basically what, you know, mirror men suit where they couldn't see them. Uh, but he knew they were in his yard and all this other stuff. And I guess he finally got an admission out of a corporation nearby that was doing these tests, and he was the one they were testing the stuff on. Well, yeah. Uh- Greg, are you familiar with the um, the Martin Cannon, the controller? Like, who are the controllers, that essay? I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it since it probably came out, and I've almost completely forgotten it. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's good stuff. I'd never... I, see, like, uh, you know, you and Aaron and, and people are a little older than me, so, like, I, I wasn't on the internet, when I think, when that came out. Um, but I, I've read it since Aaron did a did an episode on it on The Saucer Life, and, yeah, like... Yeah. 
it's really fascinating to me because it, it tied in a lot with what I was thinking about, uh, you know, with CIA mind control and like how that may be part of what we have experienced as the UFO phenomena post the 1970s. Um, but yeah, I was going to see if you had any thoughts on, the, on that essay, but it, you might not, might be a little. I can't remember it enough to even B- BS my way through it, so I'm not going to. <laughs> Although Cannon actually repudiated the entire thing at some point, and, he's, and he hasn't gone back to it. He had mm-hmm. Martin Cannon, the guy that wrote it. In fact, he had a contract without a paraphrase through Feral House to publish that, publish it as a book. Mm. And he took the um, uh, he took the uh, contract for it and accepted the 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 um, uh, advance, and mm. then he never delivered the book. And I remember oh. because he did, you know not because I think he was trying to rip part free off. It's because he he repudiated what he said. He said I don't agree with anything I wrote in there anymore. And I don't know if that's because he had an epiphany or he was told not to or what. Yeah. But I remember seeing him speak on mind control at one of the Laughlin conferences, the UFO mm-hmm. Congress, mm-hmm. Um, like in the 90s sometime, and he spoke on, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Louis Joylin West, the guy from uh, UCLA that does, it was a CIA contract um, a psychologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, he spoke about that, and I was sitting in the audience with Parfrey, and after the talk, Parfrey ran over to the elevator, confront him, and say, you, you know, if you're not going to write the book, you should give the money back. And he said, <laughs> I can't remember what he did, but he yelled something horrible at Parfrey, like some insult, as he ran in the elevator and then went up the elevator and ran away. <laughs> wow. So, um, I don't even know if I have, a, I probably have, I think I do have like a, this was before internet, I actually got like a Xerox copy of it, which I think I still have. Of mm. the controllers, like when he put it out, just as or somebody put it out, just as a as a unpublished manuscript. Yeah. So yeah, I still have it, and I know the gist of it, which is what you said, which is like a history of of uh, mind control, and I think it even, I, as far as I remember, it goes very heavily into the uh, assassinations, uh, Kennedy. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Both Kennedys and um, King. Yeah. So, so since you saw him speak, he's definitely not actually Peter Lavenda, right? Because when I listened to that episode, I immediately was like, I think Martin Cannon is actually Peter Lavenda. As far as I know, no. I <laughs> there is an actual separate Martin Cannon, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was because like, in the controllers, he uses the phrase like sinister forces or something, and I was like, aha, mm-hmm. aha, but apparently, yeah, that's, I'm completely Yeah, wrong. well, I've used that <laughs> phrase, so. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you're also Peter Lavenda. Yeah. I'm Peter Lavenda. You're Peter. We're all Peter Lavenda <laughs> and Mark Pete, Cannon. Pete, Peter seems to pop in and out of this stuff in the weirdest places too. Yeah, I, I love Peter's work, but sometimes I, I wonder <laughs> about about him, like in his involvement and all this stuff. Because with TTSA, you know, etc. Yeah, well, I think the TTSA thing. I think that was probably just a grift for him. I, I think that was a way to collect a paycheck because they mm-hmm. tried to get a. Uh, Pharrell to do it as well um, and Joseph Farrell said no he didn't want to do it so I think they just called up Lavinda as his second choice and got him to do it because if you actually I haven't read Lavinda's book that he wrote for TTSA but apparently it's just Sinister Forces like he just got money to write the same book again oh okay yeah <laughs> it's like the hustle but I, yeah. yeah yeah good uh, for him I guess <laughs> Because doesn't isn't he one of the people they think wrote, uh, had to uh, had something to do with the writing of the Avon version of the Necronomicon as well? Possibly, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He claims that he knew the actual Simon and that he helped with the publishing of it and like the editing of it. Uh, some people say that you know he denies that he actually wrote it, but I still am a little on the fence about that because I, I'm reading his uh, book, The Dark Lord, right now, which is all about Lovecraft and Crowley and Kenneth Grant yeah. and stuff, and I'm like. Whoever wrote the Necronomicon or, you know, the, the Simonomicon obviously yeah. was a big fan of like Lovecraft and Kenneth Grant and Aleister Crowley. So, yeah, you know, it kind of all fits. So either either there was another guy who was also into that stuff that wrote it and then Peter Lavenda helped him more. It was just him all along, him all along. I don't know, though. It's weird. Like, why would he deny it other than, you know, this yeah. this this many years down the line? It's a, it's a, a Satanist Ong's hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, a, in well, a certain, in a way, I'm sure it still sells, and I'm sure there's people who still treat it like a real doctrine. It works. I mean, it does actually 
work as I think it's a legit not maybe not legitimately channel text, but um it does have a foundation in like uh, planetary magic specifically because mm. most of it most of it is kind of just like planetary path working magic that you can learn in like the Golden Dawn or the OTO. It, it's not it's got this whole Lovecraftian uh Sumerian you know like pseudo Sumerian veneer Win- over yeah, it. W- w- window dressing, yeah. Yeah, but mm-hmm. it, it's mm-hmm. it's actually legitimately uh Magical stuff, and I think Peter Lavenda himself is a is a legitimately operant magician. I mean, he's way too familiar with the stuff to not also be a magician himself. So I wouldn't right. doubt that. Yeah, he's someone who you can read his stuff, and you're like, this is somebody who who walks the walk. So yeah, him him and um, Patrick Harper actually. Yeah, yeah. And ah, I've yes, people, Patrick. Like, Phil Hine talk about working some of the stuff from the like. Phil Hine has this hilarious story about accidentally. Well, you know, not accidentally, he intentionally did it, but I don't think he expected uh, what would happen. He he summoned like Yog Sototh on top of a mountain in England and had to run away. <laughs> he can do that. You can Appar- run away from doing that. <laughs> Apparently, he was able to get away. <laughs> okay, I, sometimes you can't run away from it. It just it just sticks on you after that. It's like, well, you called the asshole. What do you want? I don't want it. <laughs> yes, you did. Come back here. No. <laughs> Leave me alone. What? <laughs> so let's 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 so uh, before i brought up camellio the other way i wanted to go is men in black what are you guys opinion what is your opinion on men in black go oh <laughs> uh, well I'm, with the bender stuff you know the the sort of origin of it i think bender conjured some entities in a very pseudo solomonic right i mean if you read his you know telepathic message to the space brothers it sounds just like a you know, a, a goetic invocation. It's it's written out like a magic spell, and I think it's significant that you know his first encounter with them is in an out of body state that he has in his bedroom while he's like falling asleep, um, and then all of the other encounters he has with them are, are like these strange, dreamlike, uh, you know, possibly out of body experiences, and then later, you know, his his UFO experiences that he has where he goes aboard, like you know. I think even he mentions this in the tower how Bender stopped believing that they were extraterrestrial because he thought that they like were from the North Pole or the South Pole or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and the later stuff, I don't. I've got a couple. I think it's a bunch of different groups. I like in some cases, yeah, it may actually be like intelligence guys, but so many of the Men in Black stories are just too weird to be like actual human beings. Um, I, I, a lot of the stuff. Uh, Keel talks about specifically like the olive skinned, weird, you know, kind of w- weird faced, wide eyed guys yeah. who short, appear. short, skinny, oriental looking people. Yeah. Th- those, I actually, when I was reading Ingo Swan's Penetration uh, like last year, I started having this kind of mini paranoid freak out where I was uh, wondering if so people who aren't, maybe some of the audience are familiar with that book, there's a section in it where, um, Ingo ends up running into a woman in a grocery store that has this sort of unearthly quality about her. And he's told by these, you know, mysterious, you know, Mr. Axelrod and his like uh, sexy Swedish bodyguards that, uh, (laughs) that um, the lady was actually an alien, like a quote unquote alien. And that she was like a biological robot. Uh, she like not not you know she was like something that was constructed by an extraterrestrial force and that um, they were meant to like hunt down psychics like they could detect only psychics could detect them and they were meant to sort of detect psychics as like a counter intelligence kind of thing yeah, um, biological void comp uh, test <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I started wondering to myself like what if what if you know. I don't know about the extraterrestrial thing, but what if that was a class of being? Because I don't know of any contemporary stories about the weird olive-skinned oriental people. It, it, the, all no. the stories seem to focus on like a specific period of time. You yeah, know? like they all clustered around sort of the uh, 1970s, and then after nothing before that, nothing after that. Yeah, 60s, 70s. Um, yeah, you might even reach back into the 50s for some of it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what I would say is everything red set. Plus, <laughs> um, 
I interviewed when I interviewed Bill Moore in like '95 or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. I asked him what he thought the Men in Black thing was. And he goes, "I don't know what it is, but I, didn't, I know for a fact that it's been exploited by um, uh, intelligence people just to get information right. out of people." Um, yeah. That the act, the 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 uh, the legend, the mm-hmm. um, the all the uh, accoutrement, whatever the 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 legend around it and the, the theatricality around it. He says he knows that has been exploited by intelligence people to get information or things out of people. Um, so, you know, it doesn't mean that the that's all of what's going on. Just like Ren said, there's so many things reported that are so not. <laughs> really, especially back then, could, that could be accomplished by uh, somebody, uh, just a, you know, a regular person all dressed up in makeup and all that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it, I think it's used, but it's also, there. there is definitely a uh, uh, a lore of it that's, it actually, and Redmond, maybe people speak to this, goes back to um, way further than that, to like alchemists and magicians who would get too close to something and so supposedly some some uh, dark figures would come and tell them to cut it out or mm-hmm. don't continue on this path or whatever it is. Yeah, a lot of people report when they have like an out-of-body experience that they're confronted by, you know, men in suits or like, quote-unquote, the hat man. I've heard that before. Yeah. And these Usually are archetypes too, so of course mm-hmm. it's going to show up. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, and some of this... Like, some of the stories are so... I mean, the Bender stuff is super surreal, but I also think a lot about the uh, the Hopkins, the, Dr. Herbert Hopkins, his encounter, um, where the man in black, like, takes a coin that Hopkins has and oh, makes yeah. a coin disappear. disappear. Yeah, yeah, and he's like... Uh, he asks him, is he familiar with Barney Hill? And the doctor's like, uh, yeah, I heard he passed away. And he's like, well, Barney didn't have a heart, just like you no longer have a coin. And then yeah. he's like walks away and it's like that's super spooky and and sort of surreal like there you know when i hear stuff like that it's like i i just i don't see that something you can see at the magic castle yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah but it is i I mean mundane or not it's still creepy i guess in my mind like i'm imagining the coin like glowing and then vaporizing like in war of the worlds or something you know yes that's exactly how I imagined it too. And then mm-hmm. the other thing I'm thinking is, well, let's see, um, is that possible by stage magic? Why? Yes, it is. But the mm-hmm. thing is, people make this mistake, and I see this all the time. The what aboutism, or it's like, well, that must be it because it's like, well, mm-hmm. it's it explains it sort of maybe, but it doesn't explain. It doesn't deal with the effect of it on the person, on the people reading it. On mm-hmm. the belief system, everybody, that's, to me, the belief system, and this is, you know, sort of the lesson from Diana Pasolka's book. Mm-hmm. The belief system and the belief that people have about something is as important or more than por- important than the actual facts of the case. The facts don't make any difference anymore. What mm-hmm. makes a difference is how people feel about, believe in, and act upon the information that they have. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the operative part, which is why I kind of get tired of people ex- like uh, UFO cop people type explaining things away. Well, that was just that. Okay, well, we've slain that dragon. Now let's go on to the next one. Let's, <laughs> yeah. let's clean up the entire field. It's like, it, it's whack-a-mole. You can't. And and not only that, but just because you could fake something doesn't mean it was faked. That's the other thing. Yeah, uh, that's the other it, thing. It's, it's the argument of just because you find out you're, you're watching a movie, you find out that, that fist fight was fake, then that doesn't mean all fist fights are fake. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, true. And I'm not, you know what? I'm not throwing away people that actually look for these things. It's just, it, no, they to should. Me, they, they become, they, to me, it sound to me, they become just as bad as believers. Yeah. Everything's a fake or, we, we, you know, everything's we, real or everything's a fake. And there's no, no way that, 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 that those two things to me exist as far as a UFO subject is. It's not all fake and it's not all real. That's what makes right. it so great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and we need to look at it from every every possible viewpoint to get any real concept of it. Yeah, and those are shitty words anyway. I don't like fake and real. It doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's it's that's such a mix that when you start putting things in boxes, I think you're already off the path. Well, sometimes the fake can also be the real at the same time. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't think I told you this story, Greg. I know I told Soraya, uh, but I recently 
hung out with Alan Greenfield in Atlanta, and oh, I've never um, met him. He's really cool. I love that man. I've only I've only grown more fond of him the more time I've spent talking to him. And uh, he was telling me the story about because I asked him about uh, the whole like calling John Keel on the phone and like messing with him thing that apparently Gray Barker would do. And he said yeah. it wasn't him. It was it was Mosley and Barker used to call yeah. Keel on the phone and mess with him. Yeah. Uh, but he said that one time Mosley, you know, they were all hanging out and. Mosley said that he was going to uh, create a UFO case for them. So he like called up this you know sheriff's department and said, "Yeah, I see this huge flying saucer over the dam. Uh, you know, it's really crazy." And he like makes this report, and then the next day he sees in the news like that multiple people had also seen this UFO <laughs> above the dam. Yeah, you know, so it's kind of like what's real and what's fake there. It's like he he somehow created a UFO thing by hoaxing it. Or he, you know, clip, you know, hooked into something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is a whole, and Jim McLennan talks about this, there is a whole history in the paranormal, and you guys are completely aware of this, mm-hmm. of fakery in, and, and hoaxing in the midst of real stuff that's going on, and you cannot separate the two. Mm-hmm. There has to be fakery and hoaxing for anything to work, at least in a parapsychological, you know, yeah. for robust... Because and it's just like the UFO thing. It's there's there has to be craziness and ambiguity in there because it does not thrive in a, in the, these things do not thrive in a, in a uh, environment of certainty. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I realized about doing uh, ritual from the, you know studying this stuff for the past couple of years. When I you know light my candles and burn my incense and dress up in a robe and wave a sword and a wand around and say all these magic words. I'm pretending. I'm literally just live action role playing yeah. at that point. But it creates a real effect because I, I think yes. and this is the thing I was gonna talk about originally with the Eighth Tower. I think a lot of this is about narrative. It's about creating stories for yourself. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I, I think that this both the phenomenon and people, like just our, our minds thrive on narrative and story. Mm-hmm. And and by creating those narratives, you set the stage for those narratives to become self-perpetuating. Yeah, per- personal meaning. That's why I think you know that, that any consensus on the UFO thing is is kind of a, a waste of time. Mm-hmm. As, and I go back to that: you have to know yourself and know your motivations to know what information you're getting is useful to you, mm-hmm. because it, a lot of it's only going to be useful to you. Um, that's why I like comparing it to artwork, like like. The, the UFO or whatever controls it or whatever is going to throw a piece of artwork in front of, of like a hundred people and they're mm-hmm. all going to get something different out of it. But it's mm-hmm. all very important to each person, at least if it made a connection with them. Like like uh, David Lynch will not explain what his films are about because he knows if he does, he's going to he's going to lose most of his audience and collapse the waveform of possibilities that he threw out there by doing what he did. Half the time he does, he says he doesn't even know what he's doing, which everybody thinks is a joke, but I think he's telling the truth. Half the time, I don't think he really does know what he's doing. He just says, let's, (laughs) here's a story. Let's just go mess with it. And then whatever happens on the set or whatever, he just goes with it. And that's, that's where, you know, a lot of this stuff comes from. A lot of his greatness comes from that. And I think that's operated the UFO thing, too. It throws mm-hmm. something at you, and everybody pulls their own meaning out of it. And by that, it becomes very meaningful to those people on their level. Although, if one of them says, you know, talks about it, the other person, although not having the same narrative, says, I know what you're talking about. If it, this, it, I'm, I'm not saying this literally, but you know, mm-hmm. a, a, as a model, I mean that, that that's kind of my model of what what the what the phenomenon is right now. Well, you mentioning collapsing the waveform has me thinking here. Like, perhaps that is the reason why you have this this thing where research groups will, when they when they first get started, they they. I'm, I'm thinking specifically like psychic research. They're able to produce all of these effects, but then that. Effect and effectiveness drops off, and it yeah, decline effect. Yeah, it yeah. happens all the time. So maybe that's collapsing the waveform. Like when you start measuring it, and you start coming up with theories and ideas about what it is, and you get more data, and you feel like you're getting closer to the truth. That's when the waveform truth collapses. runs away from you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but, and because that, you I think that's... measured the waves, so all the possibilities, all you know, there's no. There's right. no possible states anymore. It has collapsed to zero. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a you know, it's a Schrodinger's saucer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, but you have uh, to accept that, I think. Otherwise, that's how you have to accept the, at least for me, that's how you have to accept the phenomenon and the study of it is that it's always going to be, to coin a phrase, up in the air. You just, as soon as you pull it down and say, this is what it is, you've lost like, you know, 99% of people that are even listening to you, unless they really want to believe in your version of it. Right. So, so how do you handle the completely normal human urge to try to explain it because that that's the one thing i was really struck by in the the book we were originally going to discuss tonight was keel talking about the silicon carbide and mm -hmm. the, the hydrogen fluoride gas and all this, like actually talking about a real like physically measurable uh, side effect of whatever this thing is like is that a fruitful avenue to, to study you know should we cause i think that's natural for people to want to like it is. find an answer you know and I, I respect that he did that in 1975, mm -hmm. and he's a god of mine, but I don't agree with him on that. I don't think you can reduce, collapse that waveform into what he says it is. And I think, actually, especially later in life, I don't think he would have done the same thing either. He's just kind of like, look, these are possibilities that nobody's thinking of, and I want to throw these out here. It doesn't mean that's what it is. It just means that we should really consider this as part of the story. And I think when he wrote it, he totally believed it. Um, mm -hmm. Right. You know, but I think uh, as time went on, and, you know, I, I talked to him a little bit later in life in the 90s and the early 2000s, and he wasn't so sure anymore, mm. um, even though he was curmudgeonly to most people. <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, that uh, it's not th those, those, you know, actual real tangible physical things are like you know it's the it's the picking up an existence by its frogs. I mean, don't concentrate on the damn frogs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Even if they did rain from the sky, exactly. So you know it's you have to be almost to me, for my mind, you have to be almost Zen like with it, where you do not attach. You know, this is a very you know kind of a non-Western thing, which people in the West understand. But mm. you don't attach yourself to one thing because if you start with that attachment, it just it just perpetuates itself. Yeah. And while that's fine if you're you know um, performing dentistry or, or planting crops or whatever, when you're talking about something as ephemeral as the paranormal or especially UFOs, I don't think that works anymore. And mm. it goes all the way back to you know th pulling the thread if you're crazy or whatever. It just it. It, it is so ephemeral that it will assume any guise that you want to put on it. And for a lot of people, that guise will be perfectly legitimate. But it's only mm -hmm. one interpretation, which is yeah. why I like to like switch channels constantly on interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, especially if somebody is not really trying to sell it to me. If it's just some quiet thing, it's like, oh, I kind of have this idea. What is it really? And you, know, and you talk to them. The, the minute somebody has money behind it or really wants your attention, I kind of don't want to hear hear anything from them. <laughs> yeah, it's that it's that there's an actual Cohen for that. You know, if you meet yeah. Buddha upon the road, kill him. You yeah, know, exactly. If this, if this presents to you in a in a concrete form and says, "I am this," you shouldn't believe it, and you shouldn't believe anyone who tells you that this is the answer and this is the truth. Like you yeah. can only find those things for yourself. Yeah, watch, I'll have a UFO thing, and I'll say, this is what it is, and it's like, <laughs> but I always, you know, I've actually written about this, I said, if I ever have this, a, an experience, an unequivocal one, I hope that it doesn't get rid of my objectivity, and my non-attachment to whatever that thing presents as. I, I think that's a frame of mind that certain people are in, like, I, I think even if you had, uh, you know, like an undeniable experience like that, like, it, you would probably still approach it from multiple angles i, I don't think yeah. that, that that urge leaves you yeah that's true i think yeah it's just a personality thing you're right mm -hmm. so um i had done an ama show a while back uh or asked for questions a while back back in january i think and one of them was was uh particularly ba you know uh focused on you greg and since I never did the AMA show with you, I'm just going to ask you, John's, John McLaughlin wanted to know, following your advice of mimic the obliquity of the phenomena, what are some methods that seem promising? Mimic the obliqueness of the subject, you mean? Is, well, yeah. Well, he, he put obliquity of the phenomena, but yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, the idea behind that is not to present some kind of 
method for understanding it. The, the, it's it's more almost like a koan. I mean, it just, you know, it came to me one time just when I was sitting writing something or thinking about it. And what it is, it's not, is not to, it's what I've just been talking about. You, if you get yourself stuck in one one groove on this, it's just going to keep digging that groove deeper and deeper and deeper. And the thing is that if you if you get out of that groove, you actually see that the 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 phenomenon is so oblique in the way it presents itself to people and and organizations and all that that um, if you if you not prepared to jump rails like that and be as oblique as the subject is as the, the way it presents itself to us you will you will be um a slave to you know looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking it's the ufo if that makes sense it, it's almost like you like what do you think about being sort of discordian about it right you, like you take like a bob wilson approach where you totally adopt one belief system but then you give it up and and totally adopt another belief system yep. and you sort of just you know constantly shift your ideas about how you think of it yeah robert anton wilson you know that that was a very important lesson i got from reading his stuff which is mm-hmm. like you know, be able to switch channels and totally believe in something for a while and then completely discard it when you want to mm-hmm. because if you can't discard something when you want to it'll take you over yeah, it's like surfing. You know, you, if you ride the wave for too long, you're you're gonna wipe out. So, you have to know when to to kind of surf in and then surf back out. Well, you, you have to know when to kick out, dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good that, that's a that's a that's a good metaphor, especially me being from California, even though I'm not a surfer. <laughs> <laughs> I've never surfed in my life, so. <laughs> I know so many surfers. They're all in the paragliding community. They, when, the, when the wind is good, they fly. And when the ocean's good, they go surf. Mm. It's just that I don't surf. So I know about them. I'm interested in it. I love watching surfing videos, but I don't want to go out and do it. <laughs> but yeah, but I understand that metaphor, which is a great one. Yeah, you should. You got to know when to kick out, dude. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, this seems like a good place to stop. You got to know when to kick out. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you guys for joining me. We're in. Where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at LiminalBird. Um, you can also find me on my blog at uh, LiminalRoom.com. And I uh, there's, some, there's a link on my blog now, but I've recently opened up an Etsy shop where I'm selling some uh, cult tools and materia. So if you want to go check out my store and see if there's something on there you might like, I'd deeply appreciate it. Yeah, and Greg? Uh, as usual, RadioMysterioso.com, or occasionally I will post on Twitter as, as uh, Radio Mysterioso. R-A-D-I-O-M-I-S-T-E-R-I-O-S-O, spelled like in Spanish. I always think I'm spelling it wrong, and then I look it up and go, oh, no, I got it. Everybody puts a Y in, but I wanted to spell it in like Spanish because I live in Los Angeles. That's the, you know, that's the culture here. And I just thought it was interesting and, and, um, and, uh, slightly mysterious to call it Mysterioso with an I. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. Thanks thank everyone. You. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of my Patreons. You're the ones who make this show possible. An extra special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Lindsay Trebet, Super Inframan, Tim, David Moore, Vincent Trewell, The Great Change, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Damian Talman, Edu Camahort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Sam Sheeran, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Matthias Sumby, Dominic O'Malley, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Linz Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Matthew Sproul, Kevin Shrek, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris 646, Carla Mahoney, and James Lattimore. Thank you all so very much. All right, that show there with Greg and Ren was actually recorded before the show on the 8th Tower you heard uh, last week. It was originally going to be the 8th Tower show, but uh, we postponed that and uh, did it a week or so later. Anyway, 
Um, I have a listener story show next week for you and a couple others I'm going to be putting up. Uh, I had hoped to get one up this week. It just didn't happen. I did get an extra Patreon segment up, though. And as for listener stories, send them along. Contact at wheretotheroadgo.com. And, uh, yeah, we'll keep doing listener story shows as long as we have listener stories. And there are a few listeners I promised I was going to get back to and have on the show, and I haven't done that yet because I got overwhelmed. Um, I will be in touch with people as soon as possible. So if I contacted you about coming on the show, uh, I, I do want you to come on the show. I just uh, I have trouble following up because I get buried in email and messages and things like that. Hey, this seems like a good place to remind you we do have merch. We have all kinds of merch. And if you go to wheretheroadgo.com and click on the link uh, for merch, you can find it all. Um, there's also merch on YouTube now. So if you're watching this on YouTube, there should be uh, merch down below. And uh, that's uh, a little bit different. There's a few extra things there. It's a different company. So we have uh, a bunch of designs on the main merch page, only a few on the YouTube one. But I will add some more if uh, people start buying it from the YouTube page. Also, you know, if you want to help out, become a patron. We could definitely use the help. It's only $3 a month. You get extra stuff. You get shows early. And, uh, yeah, occasional surprises. I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.